By the time I came to the point where I realized that I needed to manage my mental health, I had spent the better part of a lifetime entangled in a habit until illness can, when unmanaged, create. That chaos had become so familiar to me that it felt like part of who I was. I felt like I myself was the tornado tearing through other people's lives and my own. My identity was tightly bound up with a shame and guilt and sorrow for all I'd been through and all I had done. The sense that I was a failure, a screw up, and deeply inherently flawed was so strong in me that it has taken years to undo it. But it was absolutely necessary for me to see that I am not destined to fail, do not deserve to live in shame, and am capable of much more than I ever believed. There is no reason why any of us should carry the shame that so many of us still do. Mental illness is not shameful. The experiences we've had are not failures. They are things we can accept as part of our past and learn from as we move forward with our lives. And as we move forward, we can begin to see that more is possible for us than the cycle of pain and frustration that we lived with in the past. We can see that we are far more than disorder, than illness, that those things may be a part of who we are and what we deal with every day, but they are by no means the whole story. So, what is our story? What do we want it to be? We are the ones who get to write it. And, we do, and as we do everything we can to manage our mental health, it becomes less and less a part of our, our identity sick, and more a simple fact of our lives. This allows us to write that story for ourselves that includes goals and dreams we never thought we'd ever reach. There's a careful balance I try to maintain between recognizing the power of my illness and the power of my own self to heal. The paradox I couldn't understand for so long was this. The ability to deal well with my mental health was contingent upon real, realizing how powerful mental illness actually is. For years I came at it backwards. I believed somewhere in myself that if I ignored it long enough, it would go away. If I fought it hard enough, I would win. For years, that I downplayed it and denied it, and at the same time feared it like I feared nothing else in the world. My refusal to simply face and deal with it made it the monster that it became. For as long as I was unwilling to see it for what it was, I was also unable to gain any control of it at all. I have a friend who works in marketing. One of his favorite old lines is, hope is not a strategy. I can speak of the strategy that works for me, the real recovery that I can find, just as I can describe the map that I use to make my way through the world. But it's not the only map that works, and it's unfinished. I draw my map as I go. You do the same thing. <coughs> And when someone else is in need of a map, when someone else says, I can't go on, I don't know what to do, you have to say, here, I took this road. Give it a shot. Then make your own way. So what is your strategy? If you don't have one, time to get on it. Develop with the help of your support systems, the professionals, family, and friends, a wellness plan. This is not just for people with mental illness, but for all of us who are seeking mental health. What is wellness going to require of you? Be honest. Be thorough. Be specific about actions you can, take, you can take to increase your health, lower your risk, and deal with symptoms proactively. It isn't necessary to live in constant crisis. It might be familiar. It might feel really weird to be more stable. But the payoff is a growing sense that you are not trapped. This is not a devastating cycle that you have choices, that you can affect change, that you can and must have a strategy, strategy to maximize your health, productivity, happiness, and peace. When we take our brains seriously, educate ourselves about them, and learn their natures, we are able to use that knowledge to build lives for ourselves that are based in fact rather than fear. If acceptance is the key to managing mental illness, then knowledge pushes open the door. When we begin to educate ourselves, the facts can be frightening. It can seem, when, we're, when we begin to read and learn and talk about these brain disorders, that things are even worse than we thought. The statistics aren't encouraging. But we're not statistics, we're people. We're people with choices. We can choose to beat the odds. And we do it by making the choice to take care of ourselves all the time, no matter what, whether we feel like it or not, whether it's convenient or not, whether we know how or not. We have to. We may still struggle, we probably will. We may still have episodes, it's likely. But we don't have to live in the chaos we knew. And we do not have to die of our diseases. There are facts we need to be aware of if we're going to effectively take care of ourselves. 
We can't afford to live in confusion. People with mental health concerns can't afford to live in ignorance. The stakes are way too high. So it's essential that we steep ourselves in knowledge about our illnesses, the risks, the treatment, and the ways we can manage. Trying to manage a mental illness without education is simply swinging blind. So we need to be aware of what our vulnerabilities are as well as our strengths. We need to be aware that, for example, better than 50% of us will struggle with substance abuse, and we need to make choices about how we want to manage a genetic predisposition to addiction. We need to learn about the treatments that work best for us and be willing to try a variety of treatments in search of the ones that will work long term. We need to know that bipolar and depression place us at risk for other medical illnesses as well. We need to explore avenues of self-care known to improve mental health, from exercise to meditation and everything in between. We need to be aware of the cycles of illness and how we can navigate those cycles, how to steer the ship of our minds through the rough waters of shifting moods. And we need to be our own best advocates. The medical and therapeutic professions are still learning. We must take an active role in seeking care for the best care we can find and collaborating with our treatment professionals in caring for our health. And there are things some of us may have to let go. Some of us fight the need for medication because we fear the loss of the thrill of mania, or because we fear unnecessarily a loss of creativity, or because we believe inaccurately, that medication will make us someone other than who we are. The vast majority of us require medication to manage our illnesses. And it's true that when we are effectively medicated, some of our extreme behaviors, thoughts, and emotions will be leveled out. People ask me sometimes if I miss the highs of mania, and sometimes I do. But I do not miss the devastating crash that always followed those highs. People ask me if I'm less creative. The answer is no, I'm not less. I'm just as creative as And people ask if I feel like medication makes me someone other than who I am. But on the contrary, what medication and all my forms of treatment do is make me my most healthy, most high-functioning self. Am I as wild and crazy as I used to be? No, but I'm also 40. Are there things that I miss? <laughs> yes. But I'll repeat what I've said before. What I could not ever before find was peace of mind. And while things these days aren't perfect and won't be, I do have peace, and that, to me, is worth the world. One of the most critical aspects of coming to peace with mental illness is recognizing that it is very simply illness. There goes that word, sorry. We all know that. We know that it is an organic series of brain disorders and does not reflect on the people who have them. But sometimes, often, we forget. It's taken me a very long time to get to the point where I always believe, deep down, that my mental health struggles are chemical, not personal. And there are times still when I battle the voice in me that says, this is your fault, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, can't you just get it together? That voice is the voice of stigma, a stigma so powerful that we have internalized it. When we have some degree of internalized stigma, as many of us do, we suffer not only from the judgment of the outer world, but judgment from that we turn on ourselves. And that is something that we must change. For me, that has required a careful examination of my true beliefs. What do I believe about mental illness? How much have I bought into the societal garbage that tells me I'm less competent, less worthy, less human? I have had to face some very unpleasant beliefs in myself in order to find acceptance. I will continue to work at rooting out the stigma that I have taken on. And as I let it go, I know that more acceptance of myself will come. But just as we deal with internalized stigma, we must face the reality of societal stigma as well. And it comes in all shapes and sizes. It comes even from people who absolutely mean well. I was speaking at a conference recently. After my talk was done, I was just chatting with some people, and a woman came up to me and asked me to sign her book. I said, sure. And as I was signing it, she gasped. I kind of looked up, startled, and, I said, and she said, is that a wedding ring on your hand? And I looked at my hand, and it was a wedding ring. And I said, yes, I said. And she said, you're married? Oh, my goodness. Well, he must be a wonderful man. <laughs> Isn't that great? I think that's so cute. No, uh, he's great. But uh, I almost laughed. Well, she said, going on, but you don't want to have, you don't have children. I said, no. She said, I'm sure you wouldn't want to pass on your genes. I didn't laugh at that part. I was so saddened by the whole exchange that this woman would be so ignorant about mental illness that she would assume people like us wouldn't be married, couldn't raise children, 
We're just, what? What? Too screwed up for love. We know that's a far cry from the truth. We know that we love and are loved fiercely and well. For all that we've been through, for all that many of us have lost, there are things we have gained, and I know that I, for one, have learned how to live. There are tears, there are losses, yes, but I live my life with laughter and love and with hope. I'm not a religious person, but I remember something from Sunday school, a fragment of a Bible verse. Someone else will know what this verse is, so hold this in your mind. It's something about faith and hope and love. I think it ends with the words, and the greatest of these is love. Amen. That's probably true, but we need all three to heal. I think the journey becomes a labor of love. The lessons we learn on the way are about having faith, but we have to begin with hope. If you are here tonight, engaging in this conversation, in this evening, in this community that we're in, you have hope. We would not be here together if we did not have hope for one another and our world. So we need to ask the questions, what do we want for ourselves, for our communities, for our large, for what do we want for each other, for an enormously large and potentially powerful community of people offended, affected by mental health concerns? How do we want to change the world in which we live? Because we are the ones who have to change the world. It isn't always a, fr a friendly place to people who deal with mental illness. But we have the capacity for change, and I believe we have the responsibility to create change as well. The most essential step, I believe, is to accept who we are and to cultivate hope for who we can be. We have to care for ourselves and believe in ourselves. With acceptance and hope come peace. And with peace, as I said, comes power. We have some challenges, but we have more gifts. And the change that needs to come in our culture will come from people like us. We are the ones who will drive the widespread increase in education and understanding that is so desperately needed. We are the ones who will ask for and ultimately attain a change in the way mental health is represented in the media. We are the ones who will spark the legislative action that will make such a radical difference in our lives. We are the ones who will make health insurance an adequate treatment available to all. We are the ones who will demand and attain an increase in research funding that will hugely benefit our long-term health and help young people just now being diagnosed in the health of the future generation.